Well, hey, you guys, Morning. welcome to Seacoast Online. So excited to be back with you again. I'm Pastor Ryan here with my good friend Emily. Hey. How's it going, everyone? Man, uh, we are one week after Easter, and I'm going to tell you, last weekend was incredible. We mm -hmm. had, across our campuses and online, over 51,000 people join us for an Easter service. And um, so many responses to our survey. Uh, we know that God just moved in so many hearts. And uh, so hopefully many of you are back after joining us for the first time last week, and we're so glad to see you again. Got a great service plan for you today. Mm -hmm. um, but first, a couple of announcements. And the first one is baptism. Yeah, and if you don't know what baptism is, I'd be happy to tell you. Come on. <laughs> baptism is just a faithful way that we can declare to the world what we have in Jesus. So That's if right. you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, it's a great way to publicly declare it to the mm -hmm. world. Come on. So next week, we're going to be doing baptisms at all of our Seacoast campuses. Mm -hmm. If you want to check that out, you can go to the dashboard in the Seacoast app. But if you're thinking, man, I don't have a Seacoast campus anywhere near me, don't worry. Just let us know and we'll be able to connect you with a local church or we can also talk with one of your friends and coach them in how to baptize you because you don't need a baptismal to be baptized. You can do it anywhere. That's right. Pool, tub, doesn't matter. Hey. <laughs> anywhere will work. <laughs> yes. And we will help you uh, be able to take that next step. Yes. Well, hey, we're also excited because today we're kicking off a new series called Group Therapy. You mm -hmm. might not have known it when you uh, signed on today, but hey, surprise. welcome to uh, a, a group <laughs> therapy session. And so uh, Pastor Adam Martin will be our therapist and our counselor uh, bringing a message today and walking us through. But also, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was on our virtual grief share group and it just stood out to me again how powerful our virtual groups can be in terms yeah. of people's vulnerability and ability to encourage each other, whatever you might be going through. And so I wanted to take advantage of that with this group therapy series for five weeks. We're going to be talking about some really significant topics that mm -hmm. I think most of us would say that we ourselves or we someone we know has been impacted by these things. And we want to know what does God's word have to say about some of these mental health issues. So mm -hmm. uh, kicking off a virtual small group tomorrow, I want to invite you to be a part of it. Uh, it's going to be Monday at noon Eastern time on Microsoft Teams. And you might say, well, Ryan, that's a hard time for me because I'm working. I've got a during job. The week. I got a job, man. What are you thinking? <laughs> well, I also have an option for you if that time doesn't work for you to participate via Marco Polo. And so yeah. you can find that information in the group finder uh, on the website. It's at seacoast.org slash group finder. Uh, and it's listed there just as the group therapy series message review group. Um, but also you can find it in the mobile app. Uh, by clicking uh, groups on the mobile app. So yeah, we'd love to have you be a part of that. It's going to be incredible. But today we kick it off with a great message from Pastor Adam. So yeah. And you know, people, they pay hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to go to therapy. This is true. And you've got <laughs> a great resource for free that's going Absolutely. to equip you really, really well. Absolutely. So take advantage so, of it. Yeah, man. Join us. We'd love <laughs> to have you. Well, let's ask God to bless our time before we join the campuses. Father, thank you so much for the work that you're doing in our hearts. Uh, wherever people are joining from, God, I pray that they would feel your presence today, that you would inhabit our praises as we worship you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys, let's worship. Glad you're here today. Let's stand together and worship our God and King. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven It's my prayer my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony Come together, sons and daughters, but with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Oh, my God will finish what He started. This is my testimony.
so good. Come on, Seacoast, let me hear you. God is so good. Do you have something, just something in your life to praise Him? I can't hear you. So good. God is so good. Let me give you something to celebrate this morning. Last weekend at Easter, we had over 17,000 guests walk through these doors and heard the gospel. We had over 30,000 visit uh, all of our campus throughout the Carolinas, another 20,000 online. But the two most important numbers to me, first of all, were that 1,100 made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ last weekend. Come on, let's celebrate. Another number that got me really excited was that we had over 1,500 Dream Teamers serve throughout all of the Easter services. The Dream Team are your, are your people in here hosting and helping you find a seat. They're outside making coffee. They're serving uh, in Kids Coast and Custom all over this building, 1,500 people all across Seacoast serving. Let's give it up for our dream team. Let's just take a moment just to pray and uh, pray for those people who made a new commitment to follow Christ last weekend. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all that you did here at Seacoast and in many other churches this Easter, Lord. We thank you for all the decisions that were made and we thank you now, Lord, that they are empowered through your Holy Spirit living in them to take their next step. Whatever that is, whether that's baptism, whether that's joining a small group, whatever you have put before them, Lord, that they would take the courage and take that step and deepen their relationship to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, my name is Tim Lindsay. I'm your Dream Team Pastor here at Seacoast. We're kicking off a new series called Group Therapy. And our pastor, doctor, world-renowned speaker, Adam Martin, will be up. Uh, but before he comes up, why don't you just turn to your neighbor and just welcome them to church this morning. Well, good morning. Hope everybody is doing well. I want to welcome those of you joining us online or maybe from one of our campuses. So glad that we can all be one Seacoast family, even though we're in lots of different places. So let's show some love to the teams that make it happen for us every weekend. We're grateful for you guys. So today we're going to kick off a brand new series that we're calling Group Therapy, where we're going to spend some time as a group talking about our mental health. And, and there are plenty of people who are willing to talk about mental health right now. Uh, some of them are people who have battled with mental illness. Some of them are people who are licensed health professionals. 
Uh, some of them are people who just like to have lots of opinions about things. Maybe you know some of those. Don't look at your neighbor. And some of them, peculiar group, but some of them are comedians. Comedians seem to have lots to say about mental health these days. So here are some thoughts, albeit random ones, from comedians about mental health. And I'm not going to tell you who said what, because I have no idea what the rest of their routines are like. So the reason these are funny, though, is because there is some truth to what they're saying. I think that's why they'll resonate a little bit. For example, one comedian said, I have lots of great personality traits, or as my doctor likes to call them, symptoms. <laughs> Maybe you can relate to that. How about this one? I tried to be normal once. It was the worst two minutes of my life. Maybe that connects. I like this one. The statistics on mental health are that one in four adults are battling with mental illness. So take a look at your three best friends. And if they're doing okay, it might be you. <laughs> Just might want to know. I like this one too. The human body is 90% water. So basically, we're just cucumbers with anxiety. <laughs> How about this one? I like this one a lot. Mental illnesses are like middle names. I knew you had one. I just didn't know what it was. <laughs> and finally, I think we'll all connect with this. Many of us are in therapy to learn how to deal with people who should be in therapy. Do you agree with that? Again, don't look at your neighbor right now. There's a lot of clapping going on. We all know that our mental health has taken a hit over the past couple of decades, and there are a number of reasons for that. We're experiencing more instability in our country, in our community, in our families, and, and that, all of that leaves us feeling less safe, less secure, even less hopeful for the, for the future, which brings us to where we are today, where one in four adults are dealing with mental illness, and one in five children are dealing with mental illness. Now, anxiety and depression, they're among the most common types of mental illness, but when those aren't treated or, or not treated appropriately, they can quickly escalate into more complicated disorders. And, and while we might not want to believe it, none of us are immune to mental illness. Maybe that's most scary. None of us are immune to this. We see it in our classrooms, in our campuses. We see it in our churches and families, and we see it in the mirror. That's what can be most scary about this. But while none of us are immune to mental illness, there are some things we can do to make ourselves more resilient to it. We can gain some perspective on it and seek help. And let me explain it this way. How many of you are wearing glasses? Go ahead, raise your hands. You can't really not participate. We see them on your face. <laughs> Now, what if I ask you, take off your glasses and hand them to the person next to you? Now, both of you have a problem, right? Each of you is going to have a distorted picture about what's going on around you. And that's often how we, we look at mental health. Mental health is not just built around what we see. It's also very much built around what we think we see. If we think that we're a victim then most of what we experience will slide into and support a victim narrative. If we think we're an imposter, then most of what we experience will support an imposter narrative. In my world, we call this a cognitive bias, where our brains filter out information that does not support what we think is true. And our brains filter in information that does support what we think is true. And in this way, a cognitive bias can be harmful to us. Even though our minds are brilliantly designed, the sharpest and most brilliant mind can sometimes misinterpret the information. We don't always see things as clearly as we think we do. Sometimes we're working with a distorted picture because of our cognitive bias. And sometimes that brings us to conclusions about ourselves and others that are not true. So how do we become more resilient to this? How do we make sure that we are seeing things clearly? Well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to be willing to think about what we think about. We need to think about what we think about. The second thing we need to do is that we need to recognize you might be wrong about you. You might be wrong about you. And finally, we need to remember that one step could change everything. One step can change everything. And that's our outline for today. You can follow along in the Seacoast app if you want all the points and the references and all that stuff. But 
The way we're going to do this is by looking at a passage in the, in the New Testament where Peter and the disciples found themselves in a, in a spot where they, they were confronted with something that their mind couldn't comprehend. It was very confusing for them. In Matthew's gospel, we read about how Jesus used the disciples to feed 5,000 people. And right after he did it, he told the disciples to go back across the lake while he dismissed the crowd. And after he dismissed the crowd, he looked out and he noticed that the disciples were in trouble. The text tells us this. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus looked at them, spoke to them at once and said, don't be afraid. He said, take courage. I am here. And then Peter called to him and said, Lord, if it's really you then tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind in the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. Now, there's a lot for us in this passage. But let's not forget that the whole thing begins with doubt. The whole thing begins with doubt. Despite having seen Jesus do so many miraculous things up until this point, the disciples still battled with doubt in this moment. Even though they saw what was happening with their own eyes, their minds struggled to accept it. And, and one thing I love about this passage is how it reminds us that God is not afraid of our doubt. God is not afraid of our doubt. In fact, just like Peter, God invites us to explore our doubt. And maybe that's because he knows, even if we don't know it, God knows that our doubt will never survive once we see him for who he really is. So that's why it's important that we think about what we think about. And that's going to be our first point. So let's think about it this way. Consider this. Why should doubt be the only thing in our lives that is exempt from doubt? Why should our doubt be exempt from doubt? I mean, there are times when we need to be willing to take a closer look at our doubts, right? Times when we should be willing to question things. In psychology, there's something we call the illusory truth effect, which is basically it means that the more something is repeated, the easier it becomes for us to believe it. And you know, major news media outlets and some politicians, they are banking on this being true. They are banking on the fact that even if they repeat it over and over again, and it's not true, you'll still believe it. They're banking on that. But, but let's think about it this way. Here's another example. And I want to see show of hands here and at the campuses and even online in the chat. How many of you are ever told that you shouldn't swim within 30 minutes of eating? Anybody? <laughs> All of us, right? And why were we told this? Cramps, stomach ache. Do you know that there's no scientific basis for this whatsoever? <laughs> That's right. This was concocted by adults who just wanted to take a break after lunch. <laughs> it's true. Some of you are texting your parents right now like, I can't believe you lied to me. <laughs> and some of you are thinking, oh, we're going to keep this going. <laughs> or how about this one? Show of hands. Human beings only use about 10% of their brain's capacity. Ever heard this? Yeah. Well, now we have brain imaging technology where it shows real-time brain activity. And those scans show us that there's far more than 10% of the brain being used at one time. So that's not true either. I bring this up because there may be lots of things that we believe are true when in fact they are false. Things about ourselves, things about others, things even about God. And the problem is that when we repeat these lies to ourselves enough times, they begin to live in our minds as if they were true. 
That's why it's so crucial for us to think about what we think about. And it may be even worthwhile to share some of the things you think about with someone you trust, to share how we see ourselves with someone who can help us just test how accurate and fair those perceptions really are. And we even see it in the passage. Matthew tells us this, but when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. In this one verse, in this one verse, the heartbeat of mental illness is exposed. What the disciples saw drove them to fear. And then they said, What they saw drove them to fear, and that drove them to a declaration or a conclusion. This is how mental illness lives in the human mind. What we see and experience often creates fear in us. And from that place of fear, we make a determination or a conclusion about ourselves or about others. And if fear is driving, those conclusions often cannot be trusted. So the problem begins with what we see. And sometimes we're so sure that we are seeing things clearly when in fact we're not. It could be just because of the past pain that we've experienced. It could be because we're working with a limited understanding, but we often don't see things as clearly as we think we do. But in a moment that was probably equal parts bravery and equal parts arrogance or stupidity, I'm not sure which, Peter chooses to doubt his doubt. And he says, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Jesus calls his bluff and he invites him out of the boat. Now, keep in mind, Peter was a fisherman. Boats, he understood. He spent plenty of time in boats, so boats he knew. But walking on the water, that was something that was totally new to him. And Jesus invited him to step out of what he knew into what he didn't know. And Peter had a decision to make. Do I step into something I can't control and I don't understand? Or do I stay in this boat and just hope my strategy works out? It's an interesting invitation, isn't it? Because it quite directly applies to our faith, to our relationship with God. Are we willing to step into something that we can't control and we don't fully understand Or are we going to just keep doing it our way and hope that our strategy eventually works out? But it's also interesting how it applies to our mental health. Because we could say it this way. Are we willing to think about what we think about? Or are we just going to avoid that for fear of what we might have to confront? And let me say this and please hear it. We can never change what we will not confront. We can never change what we will not confront. So we have a question to answer. Are we willing to step out of the boat? Are we willing to step out of what has become comfortable in our minds and consider that maybe we have been playing some lies on repeat because a lie repeated enough times will begin to live in our minds as if it were true. Now, most most therapists, we would all agree that Many of our clients' problems, they're rooted in lie-based thinking about themselves and about other people. Like, for example, when someone has has been abused, they usually become very hypervigilant. They they do everything they can to keep relationships at arm's length, trying to protect themselves. They might do it through aggression. They might do it through control. They might do it through trying to meet everyone's needs so they can neutralize the perceived threats. Or when when someone has been betrayed, their ability to trust usually becomes impaired. And they begin to believe that it's, it's unsafe to trust anybody. They often live in a heightened state of fear that produces anxiety. And that anxiety can cause the them to doubt the people they want to be closest to, impairing even those relationships. So we use techniques to help people reprocess these experiences, this pain. So they can better understand what is true about themselves and what is not. Because we know that if we can identify the lies that have emerged from the pain, we can often help people find the freedom they were made for. 
Now, because of the challenges that we've experienced in this life, it might be worth talking about your stuff with someone who is trained to help people talk about their stuff. Like, go ahead and look at your neighbor right now and tell them you need to talk about your stuff. I give you permission. Now look at your other neighbor and tell them I need to talk about my stuff too. It was true for me. It was true for me when I was in my 30s, I found myself talking to a therapist about things I had no idea I needed to talk about. But that's where a new kind of freedom began for me also. And I'm so grateful that she was able to help me confront some of the lies I had been believing about myself and about those around me. So we need to be willing to think about what we think about. That's really important. But we also have to be prepared. Be careful. Because doing that could lead you to the conclusion that you might be wrong about you. You might be wrong about you. When I was young, I was given a puppy. And we named this puppy Bandit because of the coloring on his face. It looked like he was wearing a mask. And I was told that it would be my responsibility to house train this puppy. Now, nobody told me how to house train a puppy. I just had to figure it out, which I do believe was the mantra of my generation. Just figure it out. I don't know if you agree with that. So also, you need to know that where I grew up, we lived in a house where my bedroom had a back door that led to an outside deck. Now, home builders do not do this anymore. They don't put exterior doors on children's bedrooms for so many obvious reasons. (laughs) But that's what was true in my home. And so we had this back deck. And I thought to myself, now, if I want this dog to pee outside, then I am probably going to have to show him how to pee outside. (laughs) So I started peeing outside. I like to think that I was a leader by example from a very young age. Every night, every morning, we would go outside, me and Bandit, and I would pee off the deck and he would pee in the yard. Everybody relax. It was the 80s, and we had a really tall fence, and it was the 80s. So just relax. But this became our routine, and Bandit was successfully house trained within a few weeks. But I also created a problem because he didn't want to go outside unless he thought I was going outside. And he didn't want to pee unless he thought I was going to pee. He would just look at me like, What are we doing? Are we doing this? I don't know. So I would have to go outside and pretend I was going, even if I didn't have to go. And then Bandit would do his thing. It's almost like his mind got into a rut. Well, remember earlier, we talked about how our cognitive bias affects how we see the world around us. What makes this possible is something that we call neural pathways. Where our brain links together pieces of information to make it easier to retrieve Later, So it tends to organize them into these neural pathways. Think of these as ruts in the brain. Bandit's little doggy brain had gotten into a rut that told him, I pee when he pees. Now, to help you understand how this affects us, I have a sister-in-law who spent several years living in Kodiak Island, Alaska, where there are more bear than people, I'm told. I don't know why you would live there, but people do. Nonetheless, I'm also told that uh, there are two seasons in Alaska. There's winter and there's July. And in July, it gets just warm enough for the snow to begin melting. And as it does, the roads that were covered with snow then turn to mud. And as people drive on these roads, they create deep ruts in the roads. So deep, in fact, there's one road in Alaska where there's a sign that says, choose your rut carefully because you will be in it for the next 20 miles. That's a rut. This is similar to how our brains process things. They're always looking for ways to organize information, and they often use these neural pathways to do it. The problem is that neural pathways don't always lead us to the right conclusions about ourselves and others. In fact, The National Institute of Health, I I know everyone's favorite government agency, I get it. But they would tell you that our brains almost always prioritize efficiency over accuracy. So that's why it's important 
for us to be willing to slow down and talk with someone, perhaps a counselor, who can help us accurately understand the ruts our brains are using to process information. Because they may be leading us to some inaccurate conclusions about ourselves. And and often understanding these ruts, these neural pathways, that's not something we can do on our own. We need help. Let me explain it another way. I have here a nice, fresh $20 bill. Now, let me ask everybody here and at our campuses and online in the chat, who wants it? Show me your hands. Who wants it? Lots of you. You need lunch money today. I get it. Now, what if I take it and I do this to it? What if I... What if I get it up under here real good, both sides? It's a little warmer than it was. Now, who wants it? Go ahead. All right. Some of you don't have a lot of money. Okay. Now, what if I do this to it? Rub it in there real good. Now, who wants it? Okay. Still in the game. All right. Well, what if I do this to it? What if I take it and just like grind it? I don't know where this, what's on this floor. I have no idea. Get it down there real good. Now, what if I do that? Who still wants it? All right, we're still there. Now, let's remember, this bill has been spit on, stomped on. Some pretty terrible things have happened to it. So why do you still want it? Because despite what has happened to it, its value has not changed. Now, listen to me. I know because I've met with many of you. I know that many of you have been through some pretty terrible things in your life. But I'm here to tell you today that despite what you have been through, your value and your worth have not changed. And if you have allowed yourself to believe that they have, then I'm here to tell you that you are wrong about you. You are wrong about you. If a $20 bill can have inherent value, regardless of what it has been through, then how much more true is that of you? Someone who bears the image of the most high God. And Jesus spent most of his ministry reminding us that our value and worth do not diminish based on what we have been through. In John 8, he freed an adulterous woman, reminding us that our worst mistakes do not define us. In Luke 8, he healed a hemorrhaging woman reminding us that even if you've put your hope everywhere else, it's never too late to put your hope in Jesus. In Matthew 8, he healed a man with leprosy, reminding us that even if everyone else abandons you, Jesus Christ will never leave or forsake you. In Luke 19, he befriended a tax collector, reminding us that even if you've been running from God, it is never too late to turn around. And in John 9, he healed a blind man, reminding us that sometimes there are things we cannot see about ourselves. And after the cross, he rose again, reminding us that for the child of God, death is not the end. So remember, we have to think about what we think about. But we also have to be prepared that it might lead us to the conclusion that you might be wrong about you. And finally, we need to remember that one step could change everything. One step could change everything. Can you imagine how different Peter's life was after he took that one step out of the boat? I have to imagine the guy who got back in the boat was not the same guy who got out of it. Again, Matthew tells us, Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? You know, one thing I love about this text is Peter's prayer. You might think, well, Peter didn't pray in this text. But look closer, he did. Save me, Lord, he shouted. It's the same kind of prayer we see in the Psalms 53 times where the writer cries out to God. 
These are not polished, pious prayers. These are desperate, honest prayers. These are the kinds of prayers God loves. And, and notice the sequence of events here. Peter cries out to Jesus, and Matthew tells us that immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Immediately is the Greek word eutheos. Do you want to know what it means? It means immediately. But it's how this Greek word is constructed that makes it so interesting. It's actually made up of two Greek words, eu, e -E meaning good, and theos, meaning God. So literally, when broken down, this word means good God. And yet, it was one of the words that the Greek people used for immediately. I have to wonder if that's not because they knew that a God who would attend so quickly to the cries of his people is in fact a good God. You know, it was after this event that something seemed to shift in the minds of the disciples. They were able to get to a conclusion they had not been able to reach before. Matthew tells us they said, you really are the son of God. And it all began with one step. Eight months ago, we as a church took one step. After several months of prayer and preparation, we launched the counseling center at Seacoast on September 5th. And I asked all of you in a, in a message about a month before that, I asked all of you to be praying at 9.05 for September 5th, a.m. or p.m., you could choose. I asked all of you to be praying because I knew we would need it. I just, I just didn't know how badly we would need it. Six days before we launched, Lori Fitzgerald. who had worked with me for over 11 years and was so instrumental in getting us to a point where we could launch the counseling center, she had a stroke. Nine days after that, she passed away. A week after that, I did her funeral. We knew that launching a counseling center was going to be hard. We knew that it was going to feel like we were stepping into rough and scary water. We just didn't know it would be that rough and scary. And I found myself doing exactly what Peter did. Shouting, Lord, save me. Because in every way, I felt like I was drowning. And just as he grabbed hold of Peter, I felt like he grabbed hold of me. And I found myself comforted by the words that he gave to the disciples when they first saw him. Don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. You know, despite the wind and the waves being much worse than we ever could have imagined. Despite having an enemy who clearly did not want us to launch a counseling center, we stepped into the rough and scary water. And in the last eight months, we've grown from three therapists to 10 therapists, and we're still growing. But more importantly, we've been able to offer more than 2,600 counseling sessions to people who are in rough and scary water themselves. And listen, many of those were discounted because of the scholarship fund that we were able to establish through your generosity. Because of what you have given to the scholarship fund, which reduces the cost for care, there are people who've been able to receive care who wouldn't have done it, who wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And all of that, all of that began with one step. So here's what I want to ask you. 
what's your one step? What's the one step that might change the trajectory of your life? Is it to be daring enough to think about what you think about? Or is it to consider that you might be wrong about you? Or like Peter, is it to reach out for help? But maybe it's time to talk with someone who can help you confront the wind and the waves in your life. If that's what you need, then text the word talk to 320-320. And someone from our team will follow up with you. Or if you want to support the scholarship fund that makes care more affordable for people, then just go to seacoast.org slash counseling. All of that goes to help people get care. Now, to be fair with you, we already have a wait list. We have for months. I don't know there will be a time in the life of the counseling center when we won't have a wait list, but that doesn't scare us. Because even if it's not us, we will help you find the help you need. Even if you live outside of an area where we are licensed to practice, we will help you find someone who can walk alongside you. But here's the question I want all of us to walk away with. Here's what I would like all of us to walk away with today. If you've ever thought that you can't move forward from the place you're stuck in, then let this text demolish that lie for you. Let this text demolish that lie for you once and for all. One step towards God may be all it takes to change everything about your life. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that you don't ask us to step into the rough and scary water without having been in it yourself. So I pray that you would give each of us the courage we need to, to step towards the freedom that we were made for. Help us not to settle for anything short of that. And God, we're grateful that you, you truly are a good God. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, these next couple of minutes are just for you. We call this response time at Seacoast, where we invite you to ask two questions. God, what are you saying to me? And what do you want me to do about that? And some of you may want to go to a cross today, a cross here in the room, and, and just write down whatever it is that you think is your next step. Pin it to the cross as your way of committing to take that step. And maybe it's time to reach out for help, or maybe it's time to help provide help for those who need it. But whatever it is, pin your next step to the cross as your way of committing to it. Some of you may want to light a candle today to pray for someone you know, someone who is facing some wind and waves in their life. That maybe God is putting you on their heart because you're meant to be someone who walks alongside them in this season. Or maybe you want to come and receive prayer from someone on our prayer team. Let them pray over you, reminding you that regardless of what you have been through, your value and worth have not diminished. We also want to invite you to come and receive communion. Communion is for anyone who has a relationship with Jesus. Come and celebrate the sacrifice he made at the cross, allowing his body to be broken and his blood to be shed, that we might be free from sin. And finally, let's respond and worship together, remembering that he really is the son of God. Let's respond.
is my honor to lift the song my soul was made to sing. Jesus, be praised. Jesus, be Cross the bears, the birds. 
was a name, but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. Amen. So what could come the space between all these things unseen and this reckoning? What an incredible word yes. uh, from Pastor Adam today. So good. Mm -hmm. I know that you were blessed by it. Me too. And it's left me with questions and probably you too. And you've got things that you want to process from this message. Just want to encourage you again to join us for that virtual group kicking yeah. off tomorrow. Uh, find that in the group finder under group therapy message review. And uh, you'll see it right there. But um, yeah. a couple other announcements before you go. Uh, the first one is called Next Steps. And, you know, maybe you still relatively new or maybe you've been watching for a long time and you're like, I want to get connected at Seacoast, and I still don't know how. Next Steps is for you. And uh, during Next Steps, we go over the history and the vision of Seacoast, mm -hmm. how we became a church, how that vision still drives what we do in ministry today, um, how God has designed you to play a role in the church, and the specific opportunities to serve with our digital campus. And so yeah. uh, you can sign up for Next Steps in our mobile app by going to the Connect card form and select Seacoast Online. And the form says connect with us, submit that, and we'll follow up with you with, with instructions. So That's great. Something that really stuck out to me was when Pastor Adam was telling us to doubt our doubt. Yes. You know, I think we so can good. doubt so many things, but do we ever really stop to doubt the fact that we're doubting it all? Yeah. And something that I have been doubting a lot in my life is God's mm. goodness with my finances. Yeah. And so yeah. I'm really going to yeah. be convicted about that, thinking about that, and praying over it during the week. So if you yeah. feel that way too, I just encourage you, a way that you can step out in faith and fight that doubt is to give to Seacoast Church. Yeah. Everything that we do, um, we're able to do because of your generosity. Absolutely. So there are a couple ways you can do that, either in the Seacoast app or you can go to seacoast.org slash give. Yeah, we're so grateful for those of you that give, and yeah. I know that you'll be blessed to be a blessing. It's amazing mm -hmm. to see what God does in your provision yeah. uh, when you're willing to be obedient to Him and, and give of tithes and offerings. So, Well, God bless you guys. It's been an amazing time of worship together. I want you to in invite someone to come and join us for another service. We've got several yes. more service times. Uh, if you're on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to our channel so you'll be notified when we go live again. But mm -hmm. let's be dismissed now with God's blessing from Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon. Have a great week.